And good morning, Doug. And good morning, Kate. Oh, all my favourite people. Now, Doug, hello. Yeah. Good morning, Kate. You and I have not been engaging all morning at all, have we? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're the best, Kate. Now, Doug, the whole internet has been worried about you. So so let's just find out. Doug, and by the way, Doug, a great choice of hat, can I say, Doug? Thank now, you. Thank you. Now, Doug, we've all been worried about you. How are you travelling before we say hello to all our fabulous people? So, Doug, how are you going, brother? Uh, a bit okay, a bit wobbly because of um, coming off all the wonderful drugs they give you at the, um, the put you under and all that stuff, the oxygen and stuff. Yeah. But um, I woke up, so I'm okay, and I'm, I'm going, still going. Well, we're, we're thrilled. You you participate as much or as little as you want. We're just thrilled that you've joined us for the company, Doug. So you hang in there. And Queen Kate's in. Look who's in. The woman we're all just a little bit in love with. Good morning, Jane. Good morning, Jane. We love you. How's the teaching gone, Jane? I know you're teaching. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I finished my teaching for this semester. That's why I'm back. <laughs> I'm so happy to be back. And I have an ontological question for you all today. <laughs> so when you have time, please let me know. Oh, well, I've, I've only got water here. I can see that Kate's grabbed her gin immediately at the mention of ontology. <laughs> it, I can't hear you. are on mute. You're on mute, Kate. It's a bubbly. It's bubbly, but it's oh. not alcohol bubbly. It's Kombucha. Look, I, I, I wondered what foul thing you were drinking there. Okay. That's uh, very nice. One oh, oh, it looks it, doesn't it? It looks great. Doesn't it? Look, I, I respect the kombucha people because you're taking one for the team. So thank you to everybody for doing that. Um, yeah, we could just get some worms, cut them up, give them a bit of a, a stir and water and, and, you know, charge 15 bucks for that. But, Kate, you're doing the service for us. You're the best. And look, Donna, Donna, I'm going to start crying uncontrollably. Donna, good evening, my love. Oh, how are you? Oh, sound. Oh, no, Donna, darling, we've got the sound problem again. I'm, I'm seeing two, oh, connected audio. Donna, hi. S speak if you can, darling. Oh, no. Donna, we have two screens of you, if that's helpful. I don't know if that's part of the, obviously, you know, we need 15 Donners. The world needs more Donners. But that might be some of the sound problem, my love. Have a go. We'll come back, Donna. Oh, she's in out. Um, Adrian's in. Now, Adrian, I have been worried about you. How, how are you settling in? How are you going? What's been happening, mate? No, all good. And I had, uh, I must apologize. I um, actually dropped out last week. So if I drop out, it's just my internet connection. It's not always that good. So look, look, I won't take it personally. I won't, I won't take it personally. You know, <laughs> I'm slightly fixated on you, Adrian, but you know that. But the most important thing is we just need to make sure you're all right every week. Okay. Yeah, no, all good. Yeah. You're fantastic. And look, our favorite person, Josh, is in. Now, Josh, 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 how clever are you, Josh? How clever are you? No, <laughs> no, not at all, <laughs> mate. You, I think you should be writing a scholarship of supervision book. I seriously do. I think you're absolutely amazing. So let's keep going with that. We'll talk about that this week too. And I see beautiful gays in. We're thrilled to see Gay the week after her birthday. It's sort of the birthday year for Gay. We know that. Um, Mary's in now. Mary, um, post rejection, post rejection. How are you feeling? Are you feel? Are you fighting? Are you in fighting Mary mode? Well, what has made me realise is that it's quite possible because you we pointed out it was an ontological reason, and I've suddenly thought, oh, do people not think uh, Indigenous oral history is a valid source? So <laughs> I'm kind of um, a bit surprised by that because I did do Indigenous studies as a major, where that would never have occurred to anyone to say to us. Yeah. So I'm sitting back and having a think about that because my, my master's in, relies on Indigenous oral history as well. So um, I'm wondering how to tackle it. I am presenting on that paper at a conference in November and I think I'll ask the conveners of the conference for some advice once I've done that. Uh, and look, Mary, all of it is about 
uh, disciplinary parameters and patrolling those disciplinary parameters and gatekeepers maintaining knowledge. Now, mm. I'm impossibly old, Mary, and I cannot tell you when I started doing popular cultural history, the scraggies that I had to have with people when I was using stuff like fanzines and music and photography and film as evidence, as sources in history, right? Because it was popular culture and therefore people were interested in it, that was configured as a bit of a problem for the elitist crew in particular history configurations, right? And of course, women's history, social history and oral history were part of that, right? And so what you're now confronting, and that's why I raised the, the meta question with you last week, is a bunch of people aren't controlling uh, their disciplines like they used to. And so they're using methodological and ontological means to maintain power and control, uh, to, to control the parameters of Indigenous knowledges, to continue to render Indigenous knowledges on colonisers' turf. Yes, I think that's very possible. I mean, we do live in a very colonised... We live in the settler state still, so yeah. it's quite possible people have colonised thinking and they're just not even aware of it. Spot on, Mary. And so the bottom line for you is is you've got to decide how fighting Mary what you want to be, right? Now, mm. I, was, I was a fighting Tara and I've sort of continued to do that. I, I had to be courageous in my master's degree when all these posh people were saying, you're going to fail. And, of course, I didn't fail. I ended up with a master's with distinction and you're going to fail your PhD. But you've got to be courageous because these empowered voices around you are saying you're not good enough you're going to fail. And so you've got to sort of, you know, you, you've got to decide, you've got to pick the right fight, Mary. Is any of this helping? <laughs> yeah, no, it is helping because um, the, the good thing with you, Tara, is you've got to sort of tell us how academia really is because I think us um, researchers, we tend to come into it all idealistic and thinking, oh, it's fantastic and everyone just loves what we've got to say and it's really, you know, Everyone's going to share their information freely and be generous, but you know that's not how it is. So um, it's just interesting to come up another against another aspect of it. Yeah, and and look, Mary, I try and be a positive person. You know, Sue try and tries to take me by the hand quite often and makes me feel positive and buoyed about the universe. But you know, Sue's tried that for about seven years now, and she's failed, Mary. So, so look, it's you know, I most of you know. I mean, I've worked ten universities in four countries. I've seen amazing human beings and great human beings. I've also been probably bullied within an inch of my life. I've seen sexual harassment, and sexual assault that still renders me shaken uh, 20, 25 years later. You know, I've seen all the authorship, research, misconduct stuff. You know, this is the this is my job. And so I've I've really seen the ugly underwear of international higher education. So nothing really surprises me anymore. But you know, I want it to be buoyant and positive and better for you all. But also my job is to sort of be a little goth friend walking next to Mary going, nah, you're doing well. Don't trust them. Don't trust them. They lose when you win. That's right. And as an old hippie, Tara, I really do need a good goth friend to yeah. help me just come down to earth a bit. Yeah. No, look, and some of my best friends are hippies, and I never thought I would say that. I am. Kylie, Kylie, we're not putting that on a T-shirt, mate. Some of my best friends are hippies here. Mm. But the tragedy is they sort of are. And we do, as a, as two subcultures, we do sort of cluster quite effectively together. It is a great combination, I think. Brilliant. So, colleagues, it's wonderful to see you. And, look, I will just, and beautiful to see you, Brie. Brie, it's all happening. That's that's exciting. You just keep going, Brie. You're wonderful. Ian's in. Jewel. Courtesy of Pippa, makeup from Pippa this morning. Oh, that's great. Look, t tell her that's how I normally We're go. getting ready for Halloween. She yeah. didn't want me to take it off. <laughs> yeah. Can I say, Brie, don't worry about that. Always with me, people say, oh, Tara, you've dressed up for Halloween. It's like, that's on Halloween. I dress like that every day, right? I just maybe for Halloween. Oh, quite often, yes, my yeah. makeup does turn into this uh, yeah. on a daily basis, yeah. Look, some of the TikTokers on, on contouring, don't you haven't extended it too much from what they're doing on TikTok, mate. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're brilliant. Um, Julie's in there. Julie, how did you go last week? We were you were sort of it was Julie week, really. How have you progressed, my darling? I have been looking at um 
the concept of disconnection between the ideology of meritocracy and what's actually occurring. So I'm reading, rereading a whole lot of stuff on merit and also gone back to my interviews to see if I'm actually reading them correctly I, or, or interpreting them correctly. And Jules, that's also part of your methodology because obviously you and I'll be having sort of weekly meetings, I imagine, from next week. I haven't heard anything yet, Jules. Maybe you have. Have you heard anything? No, they said to me I could only start next year. So I thought I'd actually catch up with you and just see whether I can do pre prep or whatever. Right. So I, I'm only the dean. I didn't hear that you were starting next year. So I'm only the dean. So I'm obviously, I, I'm chief bottle washer. So Jules, I, I didn't know that. So I'm very happy. We'll start organising meetings for next week and you'll probably be finished by the 15th of January. So don't worry about that. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> Because um, I'm nearly finished. I, I think I, you gave me sort of a chunk of the thesis. I think I've got about three chapters left, which I'll do on the weekend. But no, Jules, that's great. And I'm trying to remember, Jules, and, and this was, wow, this might have been at the start of the 2000s. There was a, a book called The Myth of Meritocracy. Now, I'm going to do a search through my hard drive. But I remember teaching that uh, that book Wow, in the early 2000s, Jules. Now, I, I may have dreamt it. I may have sort of followed my hippie friends on their, on their golden pathway um, on particular days, but I think I did read that book, and I remember it being very good, very good, oh, the oh, meritocracy. I'll look it up because, I mean, the, the concept was, was born in satire. So it is about elitism, so... It, Oh, I know. It's it's and sort of we're we're now going, and of course Jordan Peterson one hundred and one. It's all about meritocracy, right? It's mm. just it's just astonishing, and it's like, well, mm. how do we going back to Mary's point? What is configured as merit? What is seen to be valuable source material? What's mm. a valuable qualification? What? How do we assess other people's credibility? There's a wonderful article. It's quite old by a woman called I think it's Daria Reutmeyer, Rothmeyer. Yes. And she talks about it as a social construct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So you know how you assess what's good in that is relevant. It, it is contemporaneous, if you will, um, yeah. and determined by the dominant group. Spot on. So, and it, and the definition of meritocracy is deployed to keep the people in power in power. Yes. 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 And there's also an American guy called Terry Moe who talks about vested interests. Yes. And how you get those to shift. He's in education in the States. Um, and I read, him, I read him years ago and it's always stuck in my mind because it is such a, it's, Mary, I missed out on the beginning because I had, I don't know who's got Apple, but you know, the wheel of death. I had that going for five minutes. So I missed out on the beginning. Um but it's really interesting when you have vested interests, what can you offer them to shift, you know? So so I'm sure that links somehow to meritocracy and merit. So there and look, we go. And look, Julie, I'm so interested because when that's like the existential question of life, isn't it? How do we summon change? And mm. that's linked in with Kylie's work. In many ways, that's sort of Kylie's big project. How do we create change? It's Doug's question. It's, I mean, it's everybody's question. This is the current reality. So how do we action change? It's, it's not my it's question. Not. I'm done with uh, change. I'm just going to just put a mirror on us. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's what I'm hoping to do. No, that's wonderful, darling one. But Kylie <laughs> certainly is hugely interested in from this present moment through policy, through procedure, through good evidence and ideas how we create change. Kyle, you want to offer anything on that before we go to the Dugster? Oh, you know, we have a sound problem, Kyle. We've got a sound problem with you. How's that? Oh, that's oh, technology. That's Madonna. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it's just my life. It's just change. It, it's, it's taxes and death, the only other two things or things that you can be sure that's going to happen. So I actually sat through, we had a, a management training thing this week and we had a gentleman who's one of our executive directors in iLaunch, Space Dude, and he just talked. And I just sat there and went, oh, my God, you you know what you're talking about. And I had my boss sitting next to me. She's like, nah, got nothing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I love you. 
So it's good to see when you see good change and management and how they know leadership and that. So Because I think, Carl, the challenge is you can believe in a change, have evidence for change, good, brilliant minds can generate the evidence and show that the change is meaningful and important. But unless you can bring your crew with you. That rolling I mean, out of it. Yeah, I mean, I call it the first follower. I'm doing some work, mm -hmm. working on the first follower for five years now. Um, you could talk on Roger's bell curve of the the first people that take it on, which just happens to be one of my theories. Yeah, look, I, look, I, I am interested in this. Obviously, you're the expert on it. Jamie's much better on this than I am. But I'm always very interested in that courageous first human that, you know, some random gets up and goes, ah. Oh. That first person who bought the first iPhone. Yeah, because you have someone goes, ah. Oh. And then everybody, of course, goes, you're mad, right? You're mad. You're mad. And the first person who goes, maybe they're not as mad as we think they are, and let's give it a go. That first follower which then creates the culture for change is very interesting to me. And you're the expert on this, Carl, but it's important. Oh, you superstar. Um, the Dugster is is ready to speak us. So, Doug, where are you on this vibe, good sir? Oh, actually, I just wanted to know how the rain went with her um, motorbike um, run. Was that this week, this month? Look, I don't. I, was it this month or was it, I, I? I think it's November, Kyle. I thought it was October um, twenty one or something, but I could be wrong. Oh, let's, yeah, I yeah. thought it was October too, Doug. But it yeah. could I, again, I could be wrong too. But maybe oh. that's why she's not here. Maybe she's still maybe she's editing and getting it all together and <laughs> having the blast that she should be having. <laughs> she has such a better life than I do. Honestly, I look at the rain and the rain. You'll see this on video. When I look at Lorraine, I want to be Lorraine. I want Lorraine's life. I want her life. But, yes, Doug, we'll ask her. Um, yeah. I'm sure she was on the run. So that, indeed, as Kyle said, that could be where she is now. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Now, we need to just check in with Jess. Now, Jess, you've been worrying me too. You've all been bloody worrying me the last fortnight. But, Jess, how, how are you travelling now, Angel? It was a big week for you last week. How are you feeling today? Yeah, it was. Um, hi, everyone. So, um. Last week, I was sort of grappling with that. I felt like research was more about, you know, finding the safe option that where you already know you're sort of trying to find what you already know is going to work. That's how I felt I was being pigeonholed. Do something safe and you know that you'll get results and then you can write about that rather than I wanted to explore and be curious about what's possible, you know, and I was sort of hitting this block of, well, no, let's just be safe. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm out. Um, so thank you for the task, Tara, last week. I've sort of journaled about why I'm doing this, you know, why is it important to other people, community, um, and why is it important to me? And it really came back to contributing to something bigger than me and what Julie was saying before about creating change. Like if I can have this tiny little part of this just so you know my passion is trauma-informed care in all settings I think the university setting could use a trauma-informed lens um, when working with their students <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that I'm getting back on track with that because that if I can contribute to that space so <sighs> You know, that space, it's been growing over the last 20 years. Trauma-informed care has been gaining momentum, gaining momentum. And if I can help that snowball get even bigger, then that would be a really cool thing to do. Right. So I'm I'm sort of, I'm not, I'm only just holding it together. I'm not looking at Kylie, not looking at Kylie, not looking at Kylie, not looking at Kylie. Um, Jess, that's incredibly powerful. And of course, through your magnificent words there, I was looking over at Sue Charlton, who had her elfish smile. Uh looking at the wonderful Jess. Now, Sue, can you can you demute? Because obviously, you know, you, you've had to fight your entire life, uh, you know, for physiotherapy, for regional health, for belief in children and children-informed care. Uh, Sue, is there anything, any advice you'd love to give Jess, who's having to really walk through maple syrup at the moment to, to, to sit in her power and her research? Well, I, I think that um, the, the main thing is to be, um, continue your courageousness um, and hang on to it because um, sooner or later people will start to 
to get a little interest in what you're saying, and then then it grows from, from there. I think, um, but it's it's very hard battle when you when you're um pushing it uphill. I reckon because um um you re really find that um that the intellectuals who are in, in the the same field as you are are frightened to make change if if you haven't got something much more concrete to show them. They don't they don't they won't um experiment with it or think about it. They just they they feel very comfortable in what they're doing. And um trying to um show them that I mean what what I, I'm still trying to do is to to say stop comparing on me with what you've already done. I'm mm. talking about something different here. <laughs> well said. And and look, there's when you were having our conversation last week, I actually flashed back to a Skype conversation I had with Sue. I mean, Sue, it was very meaningful to me. You've probably forgotten it because you're much more fabulous than me and, you know, have all the, these this wonderful social life that I don't have. But, Sue, I always remember it was about mid-afternoon, maybe five, six years ago, at when your your control group failed, when your research inverted commas <laughs> failed and all your supervisors uh, left the building like Las Vegas Elvis. Right. And they went, well, it's failed. We're out. And and I remember you and I were sort of looking at each other via Skype, me and Adelaide, you in, in Mount Gambia. And and your resolve and your strength and your desire to center yourself and continue walking was so inspirational for me. Actually, as I thought about it with Jess last week, and that meeting has been with me through the week, Sue. I found it so inspirational and powerful. And Jess, I just wanted you to see Sue. And, you know, people just, everyone, everyone sort of left Sue. It's like, oh, it's, it's a failure. We're out. This woman's thesis was unbelievable. The examiners lost their minds with its fabulousness. She's had these remarkable publications that have continued to come from it. Incredible series of books she's working on now, Jess, because this woman had grit, because she believed and kept walking, Jess. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. I, I think that... Um, um, it, living in a regional centre like I've, I've, I've done, um, the, the mistakes that I've made in physiotherapy have, have lived with me. <laughs> and the children have grown up um, and I thought, that was that was wrong what I did then and I should have done that. And, and so that's when my research started, when I started to think about um, how we could do this um, this assessment of baby's hips better because it makes a difference for life um but but if they if they get referred to a specialist and go to adelaide he sees them once or twice and never sees them again you know sees them through mm -hmm. the the operation doesn't know how that went how or it does for a little while but he doesn't know the impact that made on the family, the impact. But but I have to meet it every day down the street when I go to the supermarket. <laughs> and it makes you sort of think um, at a personal level, I really have to take that on. If I'm going to feel better about what I'm doing and what other physiotherapists are doing, I've got to make it better so that these children live a, di a, a different life and don't end up with osteoarthritis when they're um, forty and having a hip a hip replaced, um, and mm. and that's been my my um, uh, impetus in keeping keeping on and keeping on and saying, I am just this physio from the country, but listen because this is what happens. And so, Jess, Jess. <laughs> This might be a moment you and I remember as we carry forward with your thesis, I think, my love. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think another important part is I, I work on the, as a therapist, I hear people's stories when they come to me about not wanting to engage in services because it's frightening and uncomfortable and they just avoid it. I, I just won't get my hearing tested or go to that physio or whatever it is because it triggers me. Um, 
And it's about trying to break through the other side so that those mm. services become more accessible. Um, and, and I know that that can make a difference. Um, it's just, yeah, pushing through the university hurdles and jumping through the hoops I have to jump through to get to do what I want was frustrating last week. <laughs> yes. So, Jess, always invite me to your milestones too. Um, okay. Always invite me because because I seem to frighten people, Jess, and I don't know why I'm a nice person. Um, but, Jess, always have me sort of there like Yoko Ono. My role is to be sort of Yoko Ono in the Let It Be session in a bag and then I pop in the bag and go, hello. Um, so you, use me, Jess. And, yes, the, the milestones exist to enable your progress and enable assessment, but they're meant to be about you and enabling your progress, not putting barriers in place. They're meant to do the exact opposite. In saying that, I have a really, really great supervision supervisory team. I love my team. They're so wonderful. And they have shared with me that, that, that the experience of my confirmation was actually a particularly tough one and they apologised to me for it and they said that there's maybe going to be some changes in the university as far as that oral presentation goes now. Um, and they said, maybe you've changed things for the better, you know, for university students. So, oh, that makes me feel a bit better. <laughs> Yes, you will. It's not meant to be this adversarial thing. Just so you know, yeah. Jess, what I believe is a curator, I can see beautiful Kate and Eunice are ready to go in there and have a conversation with you. But Jess, just so you know, what I believe has occurred in Australia, colleagues, is that because this country has not had oral examinations at the end, um, assessors in Australia and also till recently in Aotearoa, New Zealand as well, get terribly excited at the confirmation of candidature stage. So they ask questions that people should be getting at the end, but they're sort of like a Labrador with a hamburger and they get terribly bloody excited and they ask the questions in the first year, right? And, and yeah. they think they're being helpful, but actually they're just being cruel. Yeah, yeah. I sort of thought the PhD was my time to figure those things out. I didn't realise I had to know them at the... Oral. You don't. You don't. And that's why I always have a proxy, just so you know, Jess, I'll let you into the Dean's secrets. I always have a proxy that if a assessor doesn't know what they're doing in a confirmation of candidature, they ask endless questions about method. So if they go um, method, 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 methodology, method, 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 um, that's because method is easy, method is the how, and they can always go, well, that, uh, that's your idea of a method. I think differently. And you go, do your girlfriend. Oh, I'm so excited by that. It's not your thesis. But so instead of actually asking proper theoretical, rigorous, post-empirical questions, the focus is on the how, not the yeah, was. Yeah, one of the feedbacks was to have a complete, plan B if the literature review didn't show the gap. Um, so I've had to write a complete plan B for the literature review if it doesn't show a gap. <laughs> like, why did I have to do that? But anyway, I think it also took my confidence away, I've realised over the week, which um, which was a big deal for me because I've been a teacher for 20 years. I've lectured at unis. I've, you know, and then to be put in that position where I felt like I had nothing to say and I went blank and it was like, oh, how did this happen? Whoa. Oh, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> yeah, you so are. And trust me, you're not going anywhere because I'm going to digitally stalk you. You are electronically tagged to me, Jess. So this is this is going to get messy if you go somewhere because I'm going to be like, you know, that Labrador just dragging along by their master, right? I'm that person. So J Jess, darling, no, you, you're doing absolutely magnificently. And the reason why I wanted you to just have some special time with Sue is Sue I mean, there was nothing left. It was like supposedly the research wow. failed. The supervisors had gone. They just, they're like, you know, when someone was down, they they kicked her on the way out. It was unbelievable. But I wanted you to just sit in your power with Sue and, and gain mm. beautiful reflection. And speaking of sitting in power, can you see the two glamorous women to yeah. my left that are straight in to talk to you? And, and Eunice got quite teary when you were speaking and I got quite teary when you were speaking. But let's go to Kate and then Eunice. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, everyone. Sue, so this is for you, darling. I trained as a paediatric nurse in the 1960s in Sheffield in England. And I've got lots of photographs of us nurses with little kids we looked after. Of course, I can't share them, but I would love to share one with you, and I, I can't. Um, she was eight. 
and she had the most shocking hip dysplasias. So her back was like that and her bottom stuck out, but her thighs were sort of jammed together and she fell all the time. She was running, running, running and falling, falling, falling because she had dislocated hips, but this was the age of eight and she did not have, as far as I know, had never seen a surgeon up until that time. So I sincerely hope nobody waits until they're eight these days, but you wouldn't know, would you? And Kate, that Sue's entire work about the importance of this I know. hyper early intervention. I We're read your thesis, Sue, and I read your what went wrong chapter. And I tried to use a, my own what went wrong chapter in a previous university in a previous thesis. And I was told, can't, can't tell people what went wrong. Anyway, yeah. I left that university and went to Tara. And then I, I went to Kate. So just, just so you know, and maybe it's the old goth in me. So I always have this mantra, put the problem into the work, right? So people try to mask issues in research. And Jamie and I talk about this a lot, Jess, you know, like at the failed experiment, I'm obsessed by things that go wrong, right? And people sort of, oh, look, mask that, hide that. It didn't go, it didn't go well. So just hide it, mask it, right? And so what I'm interested in, Jess, is putting disco lights around what goes wrong. So in Sue's thesis we continued the thesis by saying okay the control experiment failed let's have a chapter on the failure and what that failure was was a failure of health literacy in regional health and that then became the springboard for the second part of the thesis and the thesis itself and the short book so we not only put the problem into the work we put disco lights around it and made it in some ways the thesis itself all right, um, let's go. Oh, I see beautiful Liam's in as well. I'm terribly excited. But Eunice, Eunice, my love, you were having a bit of a sob and I was having a bit of a sob during that. So, Eunice, what would you like to say to our beautiful Jess? Uh, well, I mean, firstly, Jess, I'd love to know. Unfortunately, I just keep dashing in because uh, I'd been out this morning. So I missed what your thesis is all about. I'd be really keen to hear about it. Um, uh, Sue, I just wanted to say to you, you were my inspiration to keep going. When I saw the video um, that you did with um, Tara about your thesis and how you were about to give up, honestly, it yeah, it changed everything. It, it absolutely changed everything. You're a total inspiration to me. Um, and I wouldn't be here now in this situation if I hadn't read your thesis and watched you online and realised, well, just because, I mean, I realised now I was in the wrong place because I was in a medical education unit, uh, which is all I knew because that was my, that was my world, medical nursing, paediatric nursing, that was everything I knew. Um, but I realised I was battling against people who wanted a different way of doing my thesis. But that was not going to bring out exactly what you just talked about, the personal side of things. And that's exactly what my thesis is all about. So it's thanks to you. So it's it's these kind of meetings that inspire people. So thank you. You are beautiful. And yes, I'd love to hear what yours is about because I don't know. And Sue, unfortunately, we are still seeing children. As you know, Kate and I do medical legal reports and I've got a case at the moment of a child that sadly was missed and shouldn't have been missed. There were signs clearly there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. so, so, so Sue, I mean, you and I have, we've had so many magical moments through our lives. I met you when we were both very, very old, Sue. Um, I just hope you feel, uh, oh, I'm so <laughs> much older than you, Sue, you glamorous creature. Um, but, but Sue, darling, I hope you know how inspirational you've been. You've certainly changed my life. Um, you changed Steve's life. You've changed Jamie's life. Uh, as so many people have read your articles, all open access, read your thesis, darling one, seen that wonderful video you did with Pete. And people ha have have owned themselves and centred themselves and kept walking because of you, Sue. 
Mm, it's very so surprising, I, th I think, and, and very flattering. Um, but but I'm really um much more grateful than I'm anything else to to think that it's made a difference um in in your life and others as well. Um, <clears throat> because I think um I think it is I, I am um a particularly um, um, nutting out sort of person. <laughs> um, and I'm, ju I'm just now facing the, the fact that um, the, the physiotherapy mob and the registration mob are very dark on who you can talk to and what you can do about it and very controlled about everything. And my daughter is um, an embryologist working in IVF um, and um, not not actually, um, she's inv advising people about IVF because she's very um, um, mindful of how much it's costing people and it shouldn't be and, and, the, and they're doing lots of things to get, get people um, to involve themselves in IVF when they shouldn't be because, you know, they're, they're too old or they're too, too you know, it's that, and, and she's got very interested in um, um, hormone um, changes and things like that. Um, and she's very interested in, she, she does all her work on social media um, and and she's really get, getting into me and saying why why don't you do, do this on social media and put it out there and just you know you've written all this stuff put it out there I said well I can't because the, the physio people won't let me <laughs> the registration so, people won't let me <laughs> so Sue Dullin we're working on the referee publication so let's you and I just quietly keep Put, put, putting away at that till Christmas, and then we'll be able to social mediafy um, that work <laughs> from the peer research that we're enacting. Can I just quickly go go to Doug? Doug, is your hand still up, brother? Will you want to speak to beautiful Sue? You're out. Um, beautiful Eunice, darling, talk to us. Uh, I'm here still. Oh, um, oh Doug, uh, Doug, I thought your hand was up from last time. No, talk to us, Doug. Uh, uh, well, two things. Well, first, um, as a former client of Sue's, I think you did a wonderful job. But I'm still walking, so um, that's after about forty plus, forty five plus years. So I'm fifty in a few weeks, so mm -hmm. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Tara, I don't know if you got to watch or look at that link I sent you from the LSD. Yeah. Um, would that link in with what I'm doing? Look, I, I think it is. The LSE has been doing some remarkable work on mm. um, climate, on class. Yeah. They are nesting very strongly with that. So I'm not surprised you found that work, Doug. Uh, it, it's interesting. The LSE, a lot of the scholars there were very involved in cosmopolitan sociology, as, yeah. as, as I would describe it and my late husband would describe it. But they are now, now that so many of the paradigms in cosmopolitan sociology have clearly failed. Yes. Yeah they're now moving to more radical paradigms. So I, I I'm, I'll be watching that, and I think you keep watching what's coming out of the LSE. I agree, Doug, do that. It's excellent. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Fan oh, this has all been exciting today. And, and Professor Quinton, good morning to you, sir. Kia ora. Hi, how is everyone? It's been quite an emotional morning, hasn't it, Professor Quinton? It has. Um, I had a morning tea to farewell two of our staff this morning. So, yep, emotion emotionally charged. Yeah, it's 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 a shocking time for the planet. It's a shocking time for international higher education. But we're not going to go down cast, dear friends, because it is Jane time, and you know none of us can manage without Jane. Now, Jane, colleagues. Hang on to yourself. Has an ontological question for us. So, you know, I've only got mineral water here. Um, you know, Kate reckons she's got her weird stuff that she reckons is not a gin and tonic or whatever, so that's great. But let's get into this team. So, Jane, what's the ontological question, superstar? Oh, God, it's good to have you back. Thank you, Tara, and everyone. Um, 
this is going to be a long question because I'm going to send my full draft of my thesis next week. And I just discovered the wet ontology on Monday. Yes, yes. So the wet ontology urged the scholars to reconceptualize the understanding of space, time, movement, and experience in a transformative and mobile world. Yes. And then I listened to your three wise monkey on the way, and that's the power of the sonic, because I've been watching your vlog on ontology so many times, but I couldn't get at when I'm listening on the way to school or back. So in your Three Wise Monkey, you said that ontology is the theory of object and their relationship. And we cannot think about life without death, blackness, racism, without whiteness or domination. So by saying wet ontology, does that mean that the authors assume that the other ontology is dry? It's like connecting to my research about women leadership. Does it mean that leadership mean is for men? How about the purple group? Yeah. So you can see that um, using my research evidence, I can see that Vietnamese people thinking of cosmos ontology is yeah. not dragged or dry, but each of us is a miniature of the universe. And yeah. we know that each of us has an impact to the world. We have the connection to the convenience of life that's is trying to erase, like our connection to food. We no longer know where they are coming from and how they were treated or how they were uh, processed. We don't protect the rivers because we no longer need the river's water to feed, um, to uh, water the plant um, for us to go for a swing. So this connection from us to the nature is caused by the convenience of things that we we have. Like we no longer know what's the weather outside. It doesn't impacting us because we are inside with the aircon in. So that's interesting that my last word I put yesterday was what went wrong? <laughs> that's what you were just saying. And that's the question that I would like to ask. Uh, the separation of our life to what makes us alive is a change that's hard to feel. I don't know whether my cosmos ontology can be of any help at this stage, but it can shed light on what went wrong. Do you think I can put that in my thesis? Jane, I think you can put that in your thesis. I think I'm going to pay you to get a plane and you can just carry this enormous kite around the world with this. So, Jane, a lot of things to say about this. So I'm also picking up, if I can just clarify on the question, Jane, that the wet ontology, you've also discovered this great paradigm outside of your thesis and the insertion of that in the thesis at this late stage. Was that correctly configured from your question or the wet ontology? Oh, it is. Right. So col colleagues that don't get ontology, ontology is the weird one, right? So that's why, as we talked about with Jess, you know, people that don't really know what's going on ask endless questions about method and methodology, right? Because that's the easy stuff. How are you going to do it? How? How? I don't agree with how you're going to do it. Eh, eh, eh. Um, ontology is the difficult stuff, right? I mean, epistemology is a theory of knowledge. So we get that. So a Marxist theory of knowledge, a feminist theory of knowledge. Ontology is a much more complicated beast. And I always use the metaphor for all the Star Wars people out there of the force, right? The force, remember Obi-Wan, the force that binds us, that binds the universe together. And put another way, it is the stuff that aligns and connects objects and allows us to see that alignment between those objects, right? It's both. That's the ontology. So for Jane... Uh, the first thing I'd say is wet ontology is magnificent. So we focus all of our culture, if you think about it, Jane, the ontology of our culture is dry. You think about it from antiperspirant to the importance of wiping away mess, vacuuming, having everything dry and supposedly clean because wet is seen to be on the sort of negative problematic side, right? It's a problem. And that's a dry ontology. A wet ontology allows us to actually sit in the wetness and see the different connection between objects when we center it around the wet. Now, what you're doing, your ontology is a part of that, Jane. So your focus on the river, 
the river ontology, that the river is what binds and organises the objects around us. And it is a denial. It's, it's an outside of that ontology that we're currently living in now, right, where it's rivers don't matter, you know, use them for agriculture, we're fine, we're in the air conditioning, we, we don't want it, we don't, we're not interested in the, in the river, we are disconnected as citizens away from the river, that is our current ontology. What your thesis is doing is returning this consciousness to us so that we can suddenly see the objects that have been outside of our ontology, right? And so we see the river as central and the objects that come from that. So the wet ontology is actually a, a bigger, I would argue, a bigger picture on your river. So the river ontology is part of the bigger ontology of wetness. But our whole culture is about dry, considered, focused, control. And water is never in control because water is always in motion and water finds its own level. Think about all our cliches, water endlessly moves and it doesn't always move where we want it to move. So human beings in our ontology try and control our environment and water is the truth that we're not prepared to realise that we don't Ooh, I want to butt in there unless it turns into an ice uh, <laughs> solid which, which ice can, form which can be melted at any point because we don't have control over it or dry riverbed oh I like that yeah <laughs> absolutely so Jane is that helping so you, what you are doing is an ontological reconfiguration uh, of how we see understand and comprehend the world and it is meaningful, it is legitimate, and it is powerful. And so many of the research projects of colleagues on this group, and I'm thinking, Doug, Doug, if you think about your project, so much of working class life is disconnected from the environment because it has to be, because we've got a working class no longer in work, a working class in the outer suburbs of cities disconnected from the environment. So Jane's ontology will reconfigure so much of our consciousness about the environment and the earth. Now, Jane, am I helping there? Oh, thank you so much, Tara. And it matched with Vietnamese belief that we were born from the water and we died to the water. So it's totally making sense now. Thank you so oh, much. Jane, I, I love this. You you have changed our lives. I don't know about anybody else. I get all, I get all weird when, when Jane is speaking because it, it feels deep because it is ontological, Jane. So the reason why everyone's just a little bit in love with Jane, um, to quote the wonderful Megan who's on the call, we've just seen beautiful Megan go straight to Megan. The reason we're all just a little bit in love with Jane is because she is speaking to a deep truth for us that we do know. Um, but all the other ontologies around us about money and success and meritocracy and everything we've talked about with other colleagues on this call is critiqued when actually the river and the flow and water is at the centre of our being. Everything else changes. And that's what ontology is, Jane. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. I appreciate we're, that. We're so excited. So, look, we'll go straight to Megan. Megan, 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 Megan. Good morning, Cherubs. How is, is it? Yeah, still morning, I think, Good. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> just, just all late in the night for beautiful Donna and wonderful Liam. But so, M Megan, darling one, how are you feeling ontologically speaking? So, <laughs> you've had a major ontological week. Hashtag oh. understatement. Bastard of a week, bastard, bastard, bastard. Yeah, yeah, and a few other swear words in there as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Liam's going. Yep, I'm. Um, I know. Um, fascinating question from Jane just there. That was fantastic, and I am in love with Jane. I'm going to marry her if yes. I grow up. Yeah, yes. Yes. yeah. It, but that, that's a big if I ever grow up. Yes. Um, but what I was thinking was time is perpetual motion. Water is perpetual motion. Um, water is also symbolic in my world of emotions. So from a, a Jungian perspective, when people dream about water, um, you have to be looking at emotional stuff. Um, so that was um, fascinating, Jane, and the ontology of it all. For those of you who haven't read The Three Monkeys, The Three Wise Monkeys, get on it. Uh, it is fascinating. I have listened to that book four times now, and every time I listen, I go, Yep, 
that's deeper than I got before. So it, it has some sort of magic in it. So Tara, that really is a brilliant little book. Yeah. Oh, Megan, you're lovely. But again, I can't take any or all of the power on this because I got this from the Open University in the in the mid 1980s, where the wonderful Open University in the United Kingdom, where they used to deliver content to students via the old cassette tape. Those of you that remember the 70s and 80s cassette tape, and they did that because they argued that sound only media has a a, a deeper impact on the learner. So in other words, if we're dealing with difficult ideas like philosophy in particular, the top end of town with ideas, sound only media allows deeper understanding. So that's how I got into sonic literacies and so forth. So that's in some ways, and I know poor Gay, I always worry about the audio books for Gay because I'll keep writing the conventional books, but, but the audio books for particular areas, I think there's something meaningful as people are walking around, cleaning the house, in the car, on the train, that that they're they're getting that sort of deeper knowledge, and it's not me; it's actually the relationship between me and my voice, and you, and your body, mm -hmm. and that creates something. Yeah, and from an ontological perspective, that in itself is interesting. That as we're moving around, we can listen, we can do things, and that fits in with Jane's argument of the changed environment. Because I don't know about everybody else, but um, I have to collapse time all the time just to get shit done. Yeah. So I'm not only just walking the dog, I'm walking the dog and I'm um, writing notes on my phone or I'm listening to audio books on research or lived experience or whatever. Um, I'm putting a load of washing on at the same time as feeding the the feral chooks and, um, you know, talking to my kids on the, yeah, yeah. So it's collapsing time just to get stuff done. Yeah. yeah. No, go, go, Megan, finish the thought, darling. Uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's all, that is the, I guess, the ontological perspective of living a modern day life. It is the disconnections, but we we all find connection in doing three or four things at, at the same time, just, just to get through life. Yeah. And it was really interesting too, listening to the um, doesn't matter what's happening outside because we're inside in the air conditioning. I actually hadn't thought of that before. That is so true. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. the thing about air conditioning is it's not only controlling one's environment, but the sonic noise that it provides, which blocks you away from, I mean, I love, and, you know, gorgeous Paul and I talk about this a lot, the bleeding of sound we love. So there used to be the thing about being in a studio and, you know, when I do the audio books, I ha have a very controlled space, but I love in the podcast, you know, weird birds. So I was recording a training session this morning at three o'clock this morning and weird, wonderful Northern Territory birds decided to have a mating ritual outside of my house. And well, I the would, curlews, they're getting ready for... Um... October 31, I think. Well, I don't know. It was very exciting. There was a lot a lot happening outside of my house, can I say. And I thought, do I re-record this training session? I went, hell no. Hell no. Let's, this, is, this is knowledge in an environment and I can pretend I'm not in the Northern Territory or I can be centred and enable this knowledge. Yeah, I think it's it's grounding for other listeners or, or readers however you want to describe that. But certainly when I've, I've watched some of your videos from Norfolk Island, there's chooks. You know, the roosters are crowing in the background or the, the cows are baying or whatever cows do, you know, mooing, whatever the terminology is. Um, and there's an instant connection there. So even though we're disconnected, we become connected. And many other people have said that they love these Fridays. Me too. It is so good to be with everybody to listen to what everybody says, to learn from each other and support each other. It's just a brilliant way to do it. So thank you all. Oh, look, That's it, it. It absolutely is, Megan. And, of course, the weird thing is when I look back on sort of all these damn videos that I've done, two of my favourites actually, one of them is from Sue's part of town, is from the Mount Gambier sinkhole. I actually went down into the sinkhole and that was the weirdest, spookiest, wonderfulest thing I've ever recorded. And as Megan said, I recorded this weird one in Norfolk Island where there's roosters and cows are having a time and you could feel the Norfolk Island sort of palms making the noise. It was the most, and I thought, you know, this damn rooster is just, you know, do I let, what do I do? Do I 
do I do this thing again or do I just let the rooster have a time? And you just let him have a time, Megan, mate. Just let him have a time. Yeah. Well, the roosters, the, the feral chooks here are interesting because their DNA is connected back to the first fleet. So these were chooks that um, weren't killed when the first and second settlement penal settlements vacated the island. Um, so there was a, obviously a, a broody hen somewhere and she's just bred and bred and bred and bred and bred. So we've now got these feral chooks everywhere that own the island. So that in itself um, is is a fascinating, oh, yeah, chook is chicken for non-Aussies, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, it's just interesting the way that has all come together. Oh, unbelievable. And uh, so, Megan, you're the best in the universe and you've had a tough week, Megan. You've had a tough fortnight. Even I'm stunned at this. I thought I'd seen everything at 54 years of age. What's been encircling around you, my love, is beyond belief. So you've done, you're upright, and we're proud of you being upright, darling. And I've actually had three calls while I've been on here from an unknown number. So I'd say that it's just more of the, the same. But I'm really at the stage of just going, get out of my life. Yes. yes. I, look, I agree. I've been getting that same number, I believe. I've been getting that same number, Megan, and uh, I thought it was a drug dealer, to be frank, so I've been ignoring it. Um, so just to, just to finish off with the antithetical point from a drug dealer, we need to just, if we can get Donna, Donna, can we can we hear you, Donna? Can you just de demute and see if we can actually just get your beautiful voice? Hi, can you hear me? We can. And so, sweetheart, how are you going? How's the thesis? How's the data collection going? Well, I'm still waiting on ethics. So I haven't started the collection as yet. I can't do anything until I have clearance from the university. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, the, it's... Uh, sort of in a bit of a limbo I suppose a wee bit at the minute but I've been trying to make sure I use the time to look at my literature and add to the review and stuff like that but Donna, my time, like... what's what's held you back what's the what's the lag with the ethics darling um well I've submitted um you know my all my forms and paperwork and that has to go presumably to somewhere in the department again. There's someone assigned within the school to, um, you know, overview applications, decide what level it's pitched at. Um, but uh, so it's it's in hand, I guess. It's in process, but um, it's just I think I think this is fairly normal. It, takes a few weeks it, it, you... Liam do you want to speak to beautiful Donna because I think you had a lag on your ethics as well didn't you Liam I and I was short of time hello everybody um you're the academic nourishment in my soul all of you so I'm so happy you're all here um Donna yeah. yes this was 29 this was 2019 me this was prior to COVID-19 um lockdowns and I was waiting on the SRC to get back to me because they was the ones who funded my research and they insisted that I had extra ethical review by a lay reviewer, which was really, really helpful. But it took six months um, from start to finish. The university had also moved to a digital platform at that time. Mm -hmm. So it took even longer. So by the time I'd submitted the papers, they were out of date and it needed transferring onto a digital system. Um, so it got lost um, in translation somewhere. So I have the utmost sympathy, but, you know, I got there, you'll get there, we'll all get there. We, I love you, Liam. So, Donna, you just hang in there with us, all right? You keep doing the literature review and thinking, and, you know, we, we're laughing about methodology with our Jess through this gig, in some ways thinking about the method and the methodology and leading into what Jane's talked about, how the methodology can also move the ontology, doing that sort of difficult moving of intellectual furniture during this time, Donna, might also be useful because you're so precious to us and the project is so important, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just concur with what everybody has said? I mean, 
I've been out with the dog and I li I've been listening to the three monkeys and I, you know I I just I mean and I get so much nourishment um from this you know this is such a lovely group of people and yeah and the the sense of isolation I mean I think I can cope independently quite well but um there's something lovely about this opportunity to come together and you know, Jess was remarking on it earlier, but just uh, triggers something. It really does. Um, yeah. yeah. Human, human so beings, is. Every, every human being deserves company. Every yeah. human being deserves company in and of themselves. And we're all exactly where we need to be. So, colleagues, I thank you so much for everything. I just want to do one final thank you, if I can, to beautiful Jamie and to Kylie, because people have talked a little bit about the three wise monkeys through this gig. And as you both know, without the engineer and the physicist in my life, I think the book would have been much, much poorer. And its generalizability through the disciplines is, is caused primarily because of you two humans. So I love you both desperately, but you know that. And uh, it, the book is so much better because of you both. So I thank you for that. And that's the nature of multiple disciplines, Jess, and all of us learning from each other. So colleagues, I thank you so much for your time. It's click to 10 o'clock. We'll see you all, many of you at Right Club and see all of you next week. And Jane, lovely to have you back. Love you, Jane. A little bit. Quiet. Bye all.